This week's podcast is sponsored by Blinkist. Blinkist is a book summarizing subscription service that allows you to read or listen to the key insights from best-selling nonfiction books in around 15 minutes. There are so many great books out there, but I'm sure if you're like me and you're busy and a bit overwhelmed, you're like, when am I ever going to have the time to read them? Do you want to enjoy work more, be better at your job, be a better business owner? Sure. But you're too busy with work and business to actually read about how to improve it. So now you can use Blinkist and read things like Brian Tracy's No Excuses, The Power of Self-Discipline. And in 13 minutes, you can have a better sense of how to focus on the three major aspects of your life, personal success, career, and overall happiness. Or you can take 12 minutes to read or listen to John C. Maxwell's How Successful People Think and hear insight on how changing your thinking can change your life. Or you can go old school Dale Carnegie, the famous author of How to Win Friends and Influence People, and spend 15 minutes on how to enjoy your life and your job. It's not a big time commitment to make a tremendous change in your actual life. Blinkist not only summarizes books in audio form, but it also gives you a text summary in which you can highlight and build notes right on your phone to follow up with later. And when you're listening, they say things like, hey, here's a key message from this chapter. Here's the takeaway. It's incredibly helpful. I'm deeply impressed with this product. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash politicsgirl to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. Blinkist is perfect for busy, curious people who just run out of time to read, or even people who wish they could read but just aren't that into reading. You get the key ideas from best-selling nonfiction in literally minutes, not hours. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash politics girl to get 25% off and a seven day free trial. Blinkist.com slash politics girl. I promise you won't be disappointed. So Kim Kardashian got herself into some hot water last week when she said her best advice for women in business was to get their asses up and work because it seems like no one wants to work these days. <laughs> Now, I don't question that Kim Kardashian works really hard. And maybe if she was talking to other celebrities and millionaires about it and they were like, hey, man, how'd you become a billionaire? And she was like, you got to work, bitch. But if she was talking to regular people, you know, people who pick up their own kids and grocery shop and house clean and do laundry and figure out childcare and the increasingly crappy school system and the shitty minimum wage and the outlandish inflation and gas prices all over the place while they also work. <laughs> yeah, don't. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Last week, we talked to Adam Schiff about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how this is not some standalone crisis that started in late February, but rather a much bigger picture that's finally starting to come together. A picture made up of hundreds of puzzle pieces that tell a story. A story of greed and power and ambition. A story of lawlessness and fraud. A story of weakness. And yes, a story of treason. We might never know everything that happened, but we can start by acknowledging what we do know when it comes into focus. We can no longer refuse to see what's right in front of us simply because we wish it wasn't true. Much like climate change, we can only hope that the penny hasn't dropped too late and that we can still make changes that lead to a far better destination than we are currently heading. I need you guys to absorb this stuff so you can share it and convince others of its validity. These are the facts as I know them in March 2022, and this is what we need the majority of the country to understand before the midterms in November. If we don't open our eyes and accept the reality that Trump and Russia are inextricably linked, that Russia has been staging a military attack on America and the West for years, and that our failure to acknowledge this truth is at the heart of what's happening right now in Ukraine, then we will lose this country simply because we didn't realize the stakes. In January 2016, none of this was imaginable. Donald Trump as president of the United States, a worldwide pandemic that's killed over a million Americans, a land war in Europe, Russia threatening nuclear war, a country divided where a third of our population shuns science and truth for propaganda and grievance, the resurgence of white supremacy and anti-gay sentiment, a compromised Supreme Court, a growing pride in the hatred and marginalization of anyone who's considered different, Americans taking Russia's side over its own. If you told us in January 2016 this was our future, no one would have believed you. And if we'd ended up with Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or, God forbid, Ted Cruz as the Republican nominee, it is possible that much of what we're living through might have been avoided. 
But we ended up with a Russian asset as president of the United States. And now, as the Russian army slaughters a democratic ally for the whims of one madman, we have to look back and see how we got here. Only by acknowledging the truth can we hope to move past it. And only with accountability for those involved are we going to be able to do that. The Guardian did a piece of investigative journalism on the leaked Kremlin documents from a closed session between Putin and Russia's National Security Council, what people call the Kremlin Papers, last summer. The headline from that investigation was that it appears that during a meeting, Putin personally authorized a secret agency operation to support Donald Trump in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The leaked documents claimed this meeting took place on January 22nd, 2016, and involved Russian President Vladimir Putin, his spy chiefs, and all senior ministers. It was the conclusion of this council that a Trump White House would help secure Moscow's strategic objectives, chief amongst them social turmoil in the U.S. and the weakening of the American president's negotiating position around the world. Putin wanted NATO dismantled, the West's influence diminished, and to rebuild the strength and world power he felt was lost in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia's three spy agencies were ordered to find practical ways to support Trump in a written decree that appears to have Putin's signature. At this point, Trump was the front runner in the Republican primary, and the decision was for Moscow to use all possible force to ensure a Trump victory. Now, in January 2016, we knew none of this. But through the sheer hard work of academics, journalists, and our own intelligence agencies, we now know far more about what went down while Russia was acting with impunity and, in many cases, alignment with U.S. operatives. When the facts started to leak out, it felt messy and complex and difficult. People didn't want to believe it. And our corporate-owned media was 100% complicit in not telling us the facts. In many ways, the media gave comfort to the enemy, beginning with their refusal to describe Russia's aggressive election interference as warfare, preferring the wholly minimizing term of meddling. We brushed the Russian aggression under the rug. We failed to acknowledge Russia was staging multiple military attacks on the West. It wasn't meddling that pushed Brexit over the top. It wasn't interference that made Donald Trump the Republican nominee and kneecap the Clinton campaign. It was warfare. We have been under military attack for eight years now, and Putin won the first offensive in what Carol Caldwaller, the investigative journalist who exposed the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal, calls the Great Information War. Putin won by convincing us it wasn't even a war, and we fell for it, or we allowed ourselves to fall for it. The Red Dawn kids would be so disappointed in us. Fiona Hill ex-diplomat Security Council member and Russian expert under both Republican and Democratic presidents, says we are deep into a full-spectrum information war. And she says, what happens in a Russian all-of-society war is that you soften up the enemy. She says you get the Tucker Carlson's and the Donald Trump's doing your job for you. So it's not just ads. It's not just bots and false accounts. Hill points out that Putin now has swaths of the Republican Party, and some on the left as well, and masses of the U.S. public saying, good on you, Putin, or blaming NATO, or blaming the U.S. for Putin's invasion. That is exactly what a Russian information war and psychological operation wants. Putin has been carefully seeding this terrain for a long time, and Fiona Hill has been warning about it for years. So here we are. And it's absolutely critical we understand Putin attacking Ukraine is part of a far bigger picture that started years ago. Ukraine is just the front line in this struggle. This boots on the ground invasion part is part of a far bigger plan. An attack on the idea of the West, on democracy, on rules-based international order. This is simply the next step. We need to understand that Ukraine is not just fighting their enemy, they are fighting ours too. This serious and highly unusual leak of the Kremlin papers, verified by independent experts and now in the hands of Western intelligence agencies, make it clear that the Kremlin believed Trump was the most promising candidate for their interests in America. Putin wants Ukraine. That we can say unequivocally. Whether it's for oil or status or the dream of reuniting the USSR to reclaim Russia's rightful place at the top of the world order, he wants it. In many ways, he's been able to bring a lot of the countries that were independent after the Soviet collapse back under his umbrella. The only country that so far has evaded his grasp has been Ukraine. 
which is the big catch because of its size and strategic location and relationship to Europe and Western democratic values. Fiona Hill says, Putin wants to ensure that Ukraine, like the other countries, have no other option than subjugation to Russia. Whatever is driving Putin, he didn't do this on a whim after the Olympics. There are subsequent paragraphs in the paper about how Russia might insert a media virus into the American public life, which could become self-sustaining and self-replicating, a virus that would alter mass consciousness, especially in certain groups. Well, yup, check. You know when you sit around and you think, Jesus, what happened to everyone? What is wrong with my mother or my father or my brother or my uncle? How is the right wing living in such a completely different reality than us? Mm, they're living there because we're at war, a war of information that we are losing. And it's truly chilling when you realize that all of this was said and set up at the Kremlin in January 2016. And it is heartbreaking to know how many Americans and American companies, especially people who define themselves by their patriotism, were the willing dupes or useful idiots or collaborators with Russia in this war. Although Putin repeatedly denies accusations of interfering in Western democracy, the Kremlin documents, the Republican-run Senate Intelligence Committee of 2020, and all 17 of our intelligence agencies strongly contradict this claim. The Kremlin papers suggest the Russian president, his spy officers, and senior ministers were all intimately involved in one of the most important and audacious espionage operations of the 21st century, a plot to help put Trump in the White House. And as we all know, six years later, it was an incredibly successful operation. What we're witnessing in Ukraine is not a new war. It's a war that's been going on for years. And this idea that America isn't in it is an absolute fiction. As Fiona Hill says, all conflicts have roots in other conflicts. This hot war over Ukraine actually started in 2014, when Putin, furious that President Yanukovych was removed from Ukrainian leadership, kicked everything off. We need to understand that Putin sees Ukraine as part of Russia, at best a satellite state, and losing control of it, especially to a pro-democratic faction friendly with the EU, was absolutely unacceptable to him. Information operations were the first crucial step in the eventual invasion of the Ukrainian territories of Crimea and Donbass. Leading up to those invasions, Russian leaders made a deliberate attempt to warp reality and confuse both Ukrainians and the world about Russia's intentions and actions. This wasn't a new concept. The Soviets had been practicing disinformation for years. But in 2014, what was new was technology. As Carol Cadwallader says, the creation of social media was a transformative moment for Russia. Their ability to use hybrid warfare, which is a combination of conventional instruments of power like troops and missiles, and unconventional instruments of power like troll farms and fake news. Cadwallader says this hybrid version is a Willy Wonka golden ticket to manipulate hearts and minds. But Russia wasn't just using these tactics in Ukraine. We now know Russia began another information offensive in February 2014, one against the West, specifically but not exclusively against America. How do we know this? Because the FBI conducted a forensic, multi-year investigation that almost no one paid any attention to after it was finished. It was called the Mueller Report. You might have heard of it. The problem is, there was so much disinformation and drama around the report, specifically Attorney General Bill Barr's incredibly shady confiscating of the finished product, which he then summarized and presented to Congress without letting Congress read it. Barr's opinion of the Mueller report was what went out to the media and the general public. The result being most of us only heard his headlines or what Trump and Barr wanted us to hear, which was no collusion, Russian hoax, witch hunt when the actual details of the report had proved the opposite beyond a shadow of a doubt. Russia had, in fact, attacked our 2016 presidential election using a multi-pronged attack, and just one of those tactics was disinformation. This new military technique of using social media to sway the public opinion of the people had been pioneered in Ukraine in 2014. Putin had used it to undermine the EU, promoting Brexit in the UK, and was now ready to use it in America. Now, it wasn't just Russia using this technique. Companies such as Cambridge Analytica, political operatives such as Paul Manafort, and multiple right-wing operatives also found this technique to be very successful. They learned how to exploit totally open platforms like Facebook, and the social media companies did nothing to stop them. 
If anything, whistleblowers now tell us that Facebook's algorithm was programmed to favor outrage and anger, and nothing makes people more outraged and angry than conspiracy theories that target people they already distrust or people they've been programmed to distrust. The Mueller report states that Russian interference in the election was, quote, sweeping and systemic. It then goes on to spend almost 200 pages describing the links between the Russian government and the Trump campaign. 200 pages of multiple links between the Trump campaign officials and individuals tied to the Russian government. Russian social media campaigns designed to look like they were generated in America, promoting Trump while disparaging Clinton. A Russian intelligence computer intrusion operation against the Clinton campaign that went on to release the stolen documents. The Mueller report also concluded that the Russian government believed it would benefit from a Trump presidency and work to secure that outcome. So exactly what was discussed by the Russians in the Kremlin papers. And that the Trump campaign expected it would benefit from the information stolen and released through Russian efforts. Remember when Trump said, Russia, if you're listening, at a presidential debate? How Bill Barr could possibly read all that as no collusion boggles the mind. Mueller also confirmed that Trump campaign members, Donald Trump Jr., Paul Manafort, and Jared Kushner, met with Russian nationals in Trump Tower in June 2016 for the purpose of receiving disparaging information about Clinton as part of the Russian government's support for Mr. Trump. Now, this meeting did not amount to a criminal offense because Mueller was unable to establish willfulness. That is, that the participants knew their conduct was illegal. But that doesn't mean it was acceptable. Trump campaign members welcomed foreign influence into our elections and compromised themselves with the Russian government by covering it up. And I can promise you, even if Jr. was too dumb to know and Kushner had plausible deniability, Manafort knew exactly what he was doing. And we will break that down right after a palate cleanser, because Lord knows this is a lot to take in. Now, I do the Politics Girl Project in many ways to try and fix this broken world for my son. I brought a child into this chaos, and the more I understand the world, the more I realize how completely screwed up it is. This makes me deeply sad, and also angry at previous generations for not thinking more about the future they were leaving for us. So I do this project and other things in my life to try and offset the problems we've been left with. We can't fix the past, but we can do our best to make a difference for the future. With that in mind, my husband and I went to a Zoom speaker this week. We saw Julie Lithcott Hames, the spectacularly accomplished New York Times bestselling author of How to Raise an Adult. And if you don't have time to read the book, she also has a TED Talk. One of the biggest takeaways from Julie's lecture is that modern parents are doing too much. We're too involved, too micromanagey. We're making our children's lives our lives, so much so that they don't know how to do a lot of stuff. Parents get into this headspace that if our kids do well, then by proxy, we're doing well. Oh, we got into brand name school here. I am amazing. No, you're not. They're not us and we're not them. We have to stop tying our ego and self-worth to their successes because it's screwing them up. The lecture stressed the most important job of a parent is to put yourself out of a job, which resonated with me because I'm always telling my son that my job is not to make him a happy kid, but a competent and successful adult. Now he's happy most of the time, but that's not my job. My job is to make sure he likes himself, that he's got skills and purpose, and when he leaves the nest, he knows how to fly. Lithcott Hames says, one of the best ways to give your child skills and confidence is by not swooping in and taking care of everything for them. That we empower our children by backing off and showing that we trust they've got it. She said, you want your kid to go out into the world with a strong sense of self, knowing how to do things and believing that they can handle problems? Then stop undermining them by doing all their problem solving and planning and coping for them. We have to stay in our lane. And then she said something that was super great. She said, get a life so your child can get one too. So that's what I'm doing. I adore my son and I will do everything I can to take care of him and bring him into the future safely. But one of the most important things I can do for him is to make sure the future's safe. Doing this project is my way of contributing to his future in a way that doesn't overwhelm his present. You being here with me is part of that. We're doing something. So me doing this, you being here, us trying to understand things so we can fix the world, this is something we can do. This is our lane. And while we should back off our kids, we should be all up in the country's business. While we can't micromanage our kids into perfection, we could make a pretty solid attempt to do it to our country. 
We should take our helicopter parent energy away from our children and put it on our representatives. Ask more of them while loving our kids for who they are and fixing the world for where they're going. To me, that feels like a win-win. So get ready, America. We're coming for you. We're coming for you with very high expectations. We'll be right back after this. My friend and research partner went to a Banksy exhibit last week and sent me a picture of a piece that said, there's nothing more dangerous than someone who wants to make the world a better place. And I was touched, but I was also like, God, I need that piece of art. But since I won't be buying a Banksy anytime soon, the next best thing is Masterworks. Masterworks is an innovative startup that allows regular people like you and me to invest in iconic works of art. In fact, in October 2020, Masterworks made history by selling Banksy's Mona Lisa for $1.5 million after offering the painting to Masterwork investors a year before for just over a million. Banksy's painting was the second work that Masterworks offered and the first painting it sold, netting investors a 32% net annualized return. The ultra-rich invest in art. Historically, fine art has been used by the 1% to create and sustain generational wealth. In fact, statistics show us that the wealthy allocate an average of 10 to 30% of their wealth into the art market. And the rest of us, not so much. But do you know what's outperformed the S&P for 15 years in a row? Art. So while only certain people can afford a Banksy for their walls, Masterworks is allowing regular people to invest in them for their portfolios. They're democratizing the art market. And it's not only wildly cool, but it's a consistent and stable return. With inflation at a 39-year high, COVID variants and war whiplashing our stock market, there has never been a better time to rethink your financial portfolio. And while buying art may be out of most of our budgets, with Masterworks, investing in it is easier than ever. So start building an intelligent portfolio today. Politics Girl podcast listeners get priority access to their latest offerings at masterworks.art slash politicsgirl. That's masterworks.art slash politicsgirl. See important disclaimers at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. It's pretty cool, right? The Politics Girl podcast is sponsored by Athletic Greens. And if you've been listening to this pod, you know it's a product I strongly believe in. You want to feel better, sleep better, have more energy, get more out of your food, have less digestion problems? Look no further than Athletic Greens. In fact, Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine trying to recover. He created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own. So what is Athletic Greens? Athletic Greens is a powder supplement that goes into water. With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you are absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day off right. Their special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy, recovery, focus, and aging. It's a once a day micro habit that uses the best products and is based on the latest science. In fact, their current formula is on its 53rd iteration because they're constantly updating it as the science advances. No matter how you eat, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it will fit into your lifestyle. It has less than one gram of sugar per serving, no GMOs, no chemicals or artificial anything. Now is the time for you to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. I'm telling you, you won't be disappointed. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is gonna give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl to take ownership of your health and get the ultimate in daily nutritional insurance. And we're back and talking how the war Russia is waging in Ukraine is not a new war and not a war just against a foreign ally. It's a war against ideas, against Western unity, against the idea of democracy in general, and Putin has been very successful waging it. Now, before the break, we were discussing the meeting between the Trump campaign officials and the Russian government at Trump Tower. And even if we could stretch our imaginations to believe Don Jr. and Jared Kushner didn't know they shouldn't be meeting with foreign operatives for dirt on their political opponent, the third person in the room, Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, knew exactly what was going on. So let's back up a moment and remind you of who Paul Manafort is. Manafort took the job running Trump's campaign in 2015 pro bono and only stepped away from the position when multiple press reports about his work in Ukraine and money he was receiving from there became public. Again, we are back to Russia and Ukraine. 
Manafort worked for 10 years as a lobbyist for the former Ukrainian president, puppet of the Kremlin, and man Putin was so upset lost his job in 2014, Viktor Yanukovych. One of Manafort's employees in Ukraine was Konstantin Kalimnik, who U.S. officials believe is the Russian spy Manafort was using as an intermediary to pass internal Trump campaign polling and strategy information to Russian intelligence services so they could do a better job getting their new puppet president elected. You might remember that debate between Clinton and Trump, the one where he loomed behind her and followed her around on stage. In that debate, Trump said, as far as I can see, Putin has no respect for this person, referring to Hillary. And she said, well, that's because he would rather have a puppet as president of the United States. It's pretty clear you won't admit that Russians have engaged in cyber attacks against the United States of America, that you encourage espionage against our people, that you are willing to spout the Putin line, sign up for his wish list, break up NATO, do whatever he wants to do, and that you will continue to get help from him because he has a very clear favorite in this race. During which Trump said, no puppet, no puppet, you're the puppet, then drank water twice and mugged for the camera. Anyway, during his time in Ukraine, Paul Manafort is reported to have demonstrated vote-flipping software to GOP operatives, the same vote-flipping software that electronically manipulated the results in the 2004 Ukrainian presidential election to get Yanukovych elected. Taped cell phone calls of the cover-up led to nationwide protests and brought Ukraine to the brink of civil war. Yanukovych was Manafort's client, and he did end up losing that election, but only after his opponent was poisoned, then lived, then lost to Manafort's vote-flipping software, then the cover-up was discovered, and then the people lost their shit. The Ukrainians protested that fraudulent election so ferociously that it became known as the Orange Revolution and triggered another runoff election. This time, Manafort's client lost to the anti-corruption, anti-cronyism, Viktor Yashenko. But, backed by the Kremlin, Yanukovych was back as Ukrainian president six years later. When Yanukovych became president in 2010, he used many Russian-backed techniques like overriding his opponent's power and locking up his political rivals so he could pivot the entire Ukrainian position to once again favor Russia. But when Yanukovych ignored the voters' wishes and backed out of a deal the Ukrainians had voted for, a deal that would align them more with Europe, and instead chose to favor the Kremlin, the people revolted. Again. These 2013-2014 protests went on for months. There was death and injuries and mass shooting of citizens, but eventually the people overthrew the Yanukovych government, and he and Manafort were forced to flee to Russia. After they left, a ledger was found showing the millions of dollars that were being paid to Manafort for consulting. And where did Paul end up after fleeing this emerging Western democracy in Ukraine for Russia? Well, he ended up back in the good old U.S. of A. running the Trump campaign. And wouldn't you know, when Trump became the Republican nominee for president, his team was adamant the RNC officially changed their platform on Russia. Trump aides pushed the Republicans to abandon their long-standing position of Russia as an adversary and America's support for the Ukrainian sovereignty for a more Russia-friendly approach. You might remember that we came out of the 2016 RNC convention with no Republican policy, aside from a formal declaration for a better relationship with Russia and a bunch of slogans, make America great again, build the wall, lock her up. Remember, Manafort took the job of running Trump's campaign for free. Ask yourself, who takes a job that big without pay? Someone deeply noble? Well, since Paul Manafort has always been for sale for the highest bidder, that's probably not it. Someone independently wealthy? Nope. Manafort was arrested for vast financial fraud. Maybe you don't need a paycheck because you're already getting a paycheck from somewhere or someone else. Someone else who wants you to have that job because who needs a salary when you're getting a payout? Manafort was being paid but for a far different job than campaign manager. And that was the job of installing an American president on behalf of Russia, one that would weaken America and our Western alliances around the world. And it wasn't just Manafort. The Mueller report describes multiple occasions where Trump associates lied to investigators about their contacts with Russia. Trump associates like George Papadopoulos, Rick Gates, Mike Flynn, and Michael Cohen all admitted they'd made false statements to federal investigators or to Congress about their contacts in Russia. And it wasn't just weaponized social media and the selling out our country to Russian intelligence. 
The Mueller report also confirmed Russia targeted databases in many states to gain access to the voter information of millions of Americans. Mueller found other contacts with Russia, such as the sharing of polling data about Midwestern states where Trump would later win upset victories. Remember, it was Manafort who pitched vote-flipping software a decade before, right before the Kerry Bush election, in fact, an election that a lot of outside eyes seemed to find quite suspect. Then you add in things like Senator Lindsey Graham making odd statements like, if we don't do something about voting by mail, we're going to lose the ability to elect a Republican in this country. Why would he care if people voted by mail unless Republican victories were dependent on voting by machine? And not just any machine. ES and S machines, the company Republican operatives aren't targeting for fraud right now. We hear about Dominion, we hear about Smartmatic, but not a word from the Republicans supposedly hell-bent on getting to the bottom of this cheating crisis about ES and S, which, by the way, is America's largest voting machine company. In fact, the voting results in the three states that saw surprising majorities by very vulnerable incumbent Republican senators, Maine, North Carolina, and South Carolina, were almost all tabulated on ES and S machines. 40 out of 50 states use ES and S machines to count at least some of their votes. Of the 25 states Trump won, all but three either partially or fully relied on ES and S machines. ES and S is owned by a private equity firm and has been very evasive about identifying who actually owns it. However, a number of ES and S executives and lobbyists have ties to top GOP election officials and politicians. As election security expert Jennifer Cohen points out, in 2015, Florida and Wisconsin both added wireless modems to their ES&S voting systems, which connected the systems to the internet, opening the door to what experts call a man-in-the-middle hack, where instead of the votes going from the server directly to where they're tabulated, it is possible to reroute them to a man-in-the-middle, who could theoretically make changes to the votes before they get tabulated just like what happened in Ukraine in 2004. With our electoral college system, you would only have to make subtle adjustments, intercepting the votes before they go to official computers for tabulation, to change the outcome of the whole election. These modems are in Michigan, too. Please remember, Trump unexpectedly won Michigan by a narrow margin of 0.23%. It was the narrowest margin of victory in the state's presidential history. He also unexpectedly won Wisconsin by a margin of 0.77%. We've all heard the famous quote from Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels, accuse the other side of that which you are guilty. How much have we heard about the Democrats stealing the election, about voter fraud, about Dominion and Smartmatic flipping votes? Is it possible that it's all part of a plan to make us look away from what the Republicans themselves have been doing for years? Election security expert Andrew Appel explains that wireless modems and ballot scanners make it very easy for that type of man-in-the-middle attack, and we can't ignore the fact that we've had some very bizarre election results in numerous states. Like, how is it possible that tens of thousands of ballots voted straight Democrat except for the president? Because that's weird. No? We know Putin's elections in Russia aren't fair. We know the Putin-backed Lukashenko election in Belarus was rigged. We know the Putin-backed Yanukovych cheated when he won in 2004 because Manafort was caught talking about it on a recorded phone. Our democracy relies on private companies, which build their own electronic systems to reliably count our votes. It seems reasonable, if not crucial, that we should understand who is behind these companies and who is ensuring our election's integrity. Without that knowledge, we run the risk that operatives or investors with financial stakes in who wins the election or those who are susceptible to bribery can use their software to deliberately miscount votes and guarantee an outcome. As political investigative journalist Allison Green says, in close elections, software code that invalidates or miscounts a mere sliver of ballots can change the outcome. John Kerry suggested there might have been fraud in his election. We all know that Al Gore should have and, quite frankly, did win his election. Russia was all over the Clinton-Trump election. And the far right are mercilessly attacking ES&S competitors, despite the fact that ES&S machines tabulated the majority of votes in this country, a lot of them coming out in favor of Republicans, despite them polling 
way behind. Now, I can't prove anything specifically to be true, but I do believe that Democrats insisting that the elections were the safest ever to counter the Republican narrative that they were rigged wasn't entirely true. And in their attempt to secure people's faith in our democratic system, they may have just undermined American democracy to their own detriment. Gore, Kerry, and Clinton all stepped aside without complaint, despite how sketchy their losses appeared, because they believed they were doing what was best for our faith in the system. But perhaps it wasn't what was best for democracy itself. We could clear this up pretty easily by simply switching our elections to hand-marked paper ballots or universal vote by mail. We should definitely be removing all wireless modems from machines and making sure that if votes are cast on machines, they are transmitted only via a secure landline. Forget the conspiracy theories, even my own. Forget the propaganda. What's done is done. Let's just get back to basics. Simple, unhackable, completely traceable voting. Then we will really know who the voters are choosing. There has to be a reason, Lindsey Graham said on NPR, mail-in balloting is a nightmare for us. If we don't fight back, we are never going to win president again. Because that is an extremely odd thing to say. And we have to do something about this propaganda disinformation war. Experts like Fiona Hill have been very clear that Russia has been waging a war on us for a long time. When asked if we were on the brink of World War III, she said, we're already in it. Not just America, but the West. And Russia has been incredibly successful in their goal of undermining our strength, our democracies, and our national unity. Brexit was a war of disinformation, and the Russians won when the UK left the EU. Trump's election was a war of disinformation, and perhaps voter fraud, and Putin won when Hillary lost. Really, Trump's presidency was a bigger success than they could have ever imagined. Think back to what Trump did while in office. He changed the Republican and then the American policy and position on Russia and Ukraine. He undermined NATO at every turn, and according to former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton, was planning to remove America from NATO in his second term. He reduced American forces in Europe. He pulled American troops from Germany. He met in private with Putin in Helsinki and then took Putin's side over our own intelligence agencies when they insisted Putin had interfered in our election. He took the translator records from that meeting so no one could see what had been said. He fired his attorney, Jeff Sessions, the first Republican who had ever backed him for president, for recusing himself from the Russia investigation and put a better yes man in his place named Bill Barr. Barr went on to intercept the 22-month investigation into Russian interference and redact almost the entire Mueller report from the public's view and distill it into a complete exoneration of Trump, something the actual report completely refuted. Trump overlooked Russian bounties put on the heads of American soldiers in the Middle East. He effectively handed Syria to Russian control. He pulled out of arms deals that constrained Russians. He pulled out of multiple international organizations and sought to weaken the international order that constrained Russia and its allies. He made it impossible for his staff to raise issues around being tough on Russia. He celebrated Putin publicly and privately. He parroted Putin's talking points like Crimea wanting to be part of Russia. And he denied promised military aid to Ukraine to fight Russian aggression in the East. He tried to shake down President Zelensky to drum up fake controversy against his political rival. He was later impeached for what could only be considered blackmail of an international ally for his own personal benefit. And when those in his inner circle were arrested, indicted, and charged in the Russia investigation, he told them to stay strong, not rat, and then used the office of the presidency to pardon them for all of their crimes. As David Rothkopf, Professor of International Relations and Political Scientist says, I'll tell you something. Looking at what Trump did, wanted to do, and was often stopped from doing in retrospect is even more shocking than it was in real time. As Rothkopf points out, even if you didn't know that Putin actively tried to help him get elected, as our intelligence community, the Mueller report, and the Kremlin files now unanimously conclude— Even if he did not surround himself with pro-Putin lackeys, even if his businesses were not swimming in Russian money, even if he didn't try to block measures to make it harder for the government to stop Russian interference in 2018 and 2020, his record on Russia is clear and shocking. Now, it's plausible that Trump is simply just the useful idiot here. You could make the argument that for Trump, there really was no collusion. And by that, I mean he wasn't in on the plan. That the stable genius's vanity and hubris and narcissism made him blind to things that were happening around him. 
that he simply wants to believe he got everything on his own, and because everyone treats him like a king, he doesn't realize he's a pawn. At the end of the day, it's about winning, personally winning. Everything else, his wives, his children, the American citizen, American democracy means nothing to him. It's his brand, his image, his status that matters. And that's what made him such a great mark for Putin. Whether Trump knew or not, his pattern of behavior is undeniable. The consequences if Trump had been just a little less inept and more successful at pushing his agenda would have been disastrous for the U.S. and spectacular for Putin. And let us not forget, in December 2020, after he lost re-election, 18,000 private and government companies were hacked by Russia in the biggest data breach in our country's history. We're talking the Treasury Department, Commerce Department, the CDC, the State Department, the Justice Department, the Pentagon, and a whole mess of utility companies. It is now assumed the Russians have access to the American power grid. The NSA was hacked, the Department of Homeland Security, and nearly all Fortune 500 companies. Analysts of the breach say it's hard to know which is worse, that the federal government under Trump was blindsided by Russian intelligence, or that when it was evident the hack was going on, the White House said nothing. They go on to say this much is clear. While President Trump was complaining about the false hacking of votes, a real hack was happening, and he said nothing. And as Rothkop so brilliantly points out, all of this was before the first attempted coup in U.S. history. All of this was before Trump tried to blow up the very foundations of American democracy, which of course has always been Russia's ultimate goal. As Nikita Khrushchev famously said in 1956, we will take America without firing a shot. We don't have to invade the U.S. We will destroy you from within. And I understand that Trump supporters and anyone else who wants to pretend things are normal and okay won't want to hear this. I understand that the idea of a Russian hoax is so much easier to swallow than the truth. But you just have to look at Trump's actions to see the primary occupation of the Trump presidency was to benefit himself while weakening the U.S. He weakened our alliances, our international system, and he strengthened and often defended the position of Russia itself. So much so that Russia felt emboldened to invade a sovereign nation. Rothkop says the story of Russia's attack on Ukraine and Trump's attack on democracy are the same story, part of an extended global effort by Russia to attack democracies worldwide. Their techniques might differ. There's no equating the suffering Ukraine is going through with what we've experienced in the U.S. or has been experienced in other Western democracies in which Putin has invested time and assets trying to weaken. But by denying the connection, by not acknowledging the bigger picture, we make it that much harder for ourselves to defeat Putin's efforts. Rothkop is adamant when he says, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is conspiracy fact. We've seen it. Investigations have provided mountains of evidence. And now it's time to find a holistic solution for dealing with it. When President Biden speaks of the battle between autocracy and democracy, this is part of it. This is the reality of it. War in Ukraine, subterfuge in the U.S., armies abroad, traitors at home, links between right-wing ethno-nationalists worldwide, destructive disinformation, all of these elements have a single objective, undercut, diminish, and destroy democracy. Intellectual honesty demands we see these connections so we can become singularly focused on defeating Putin and his anti-democratic coalition worldwide, even if many of his soldiers are American citizens themselves. In a future pod, we will delve deeper into the Republican Party and the far right's evolving role in this war. But for now, as Rothkopf says, sleep on these ideas. And then tomorrow, if you doubt it, check the facts. Everything I've discussed today is sourced in the show notes, but keep digging. I'm not trying to tie it all together. That will be up to career prosecutors and intelligence agencies and brilliant investigative journalists. And it will be up to our Justice Department, Department of Defense and Homeland Security to follow through with what they find. If anything, I'm laying the pieces out. We're looking at a 10,000 piece puzzle and I'm flipping the pieces over and sorting them by color and design so you can start to see what we're working with. And once you can see it, then you have to find a way to fight back because the stakes are too high to do nothing. This is nothing less than our future on the line. So that's it for this week. Do what you can to question what you read, what you hear, and the motivations of those who are saying it. 
send money to Ukraine, who are the frontline soldiers in the next phase of this war. Nothing is off the table for Putin, so you can't leave anything on the table to fight his influence here at home. Once you realize all these pieces go together, everything starts to make sense. It won't make you happy, but it'll certainly make you less confused. Now go out and make the world a better place. Thank you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Until next week, PG out. If you're passionate about fighting for democracy, don't forget to support the Midas Media Network and all their pro-democracy work around America. Watch or listen to the Midas Touch podcast or my personal fave, Legal AF. We're all in this together, and supporting their work is a great way to get involved. And no, they didn't ask me to do this. I just think what they're doing is really great. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.